Hi, everyone. Welcome to the OCP Virtual Summit and to our panel today on network operating systems, disaggregation, and OCP networking. Uh, my name is Omar, and together with Shin today, we'll be moderating this panel. And uh, we have four panelists today from uh, different companies that work on network operating systems. What we'll do is we'll go through first and have them each introduce themselves, starting with Pete. Hi, I'm Pete Lumbus. I run technical marketing here at Cumulus Networks. Uh, we make a network operating system that runs on white box and bright box switches from a bunch of different manufacturers, over 100 different platforms, uh, including a number of OCP certified and OCP inspired platforms. Uh, we've been involved in OCP uh, basically since the very beginning. Um, we continue to have a pretty strong dedication to OCP. Great. Thanks, Pete. Moving on to Ricardo. Thanks, Omar. Um, I'm Ricardo Pianta. I'm responsible for the engineering manager at Datacom. Uh, Datacom designs and manufactures its own uh, data communications equipment since 1999. Uh, the company started with a PDA SDH product for transport networks, a pre legacy series of products. And uh, 12 years ago, uh, we introduced our first uh, Ethernet switch in the market. Um, nowadays, we have we are in the second generation of those uh, switches, and we have a complete portfolio, including access, aggregation, and transport, mostly for campus and, and metro Ethernet uh, segments. Uh, we have probably the most important R&D group in, in Latin America, and with a very uh, strong vertical expertise. We, we have knowledge from the basic hardware, FPGA design, uh, low-level uh, BSP, uh, Broadcom's SDK, kernel, network protocols. So it's a it's a pretty uh, broad set of knowledge that gives us some uh, advantage in terms of playing in a lot of different areas. Uh, we have been working at Segregated and NOS uh, for quite a while, and including uh, activities in other segments like uh, virtual OLTs and also uh, telecom infra project. Great, thank you, Ricardo. And Philippe? Hi, um, I'm Philippe uh, Michelet. I'm leading the product management activities at Calum. Uh, so what is Calum doing? Uh, Calum um, initially designed uh, a software-defined fabric as the ability to uh, control in a fully open way uh, an entire set of leaf and spine switches. Uh, for the last year or so, the focus is now to develop uh, very specifically, a set of 5G services, starting with user plane function, uh, leveraging uh, OCP design switches, and in particular, the Wedge 100, uh, based on the barefoot uh, Tofino ASIC, uh, with, again, a uh, multi-terabit of throughput uh, with a complete interoperability with uh, multiple vendors. Thank you. And then uh, wrapping up with Joe. Hi, Omar. Thank you. I'm Joe Whitehouse. I'm VP of Sales and Business Development for the networking software part of Metaswitch. Um, so at Metaswitch, we consider ourselves the experts in networking software. And I say experts because we're actually entering into our fifth decade of providing networking software for both hardware and software system vendors. And so over those 40 plus years, we've seen a lot of advancements, whether it be uh, software-defined networking, the rise of IP traffic, and now and now open networking. And throughout those times, we've really enabled our customers in, in three ways. The first is business transformation. So that could be things like ha helping hardware-centric vendors become more software-centric, um, having our customers go from a proprietary solution to an open solution. Um, second um, feature that we provide is really adding new revenue streams and go-to-markets. So we're typically working with enterprise customers who want to serve the telco market or the telco customers trying to migrate towards the enterprise market. Um, and then lastly is just accelerating time to market or feature velocity. And again, we've been doing this for a long time. Customers include Cisco, Alcatel, Lucent, Huawei, Adva, Sienna, Datacom, um, and even smaller players like Versa and Silver Peak. So glad to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll move on to the, the first question. You, you can, you've just heard from the panelists uh, quite a varied set of backgrounds, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of time within networking. So 
Um, we'll start off with the first question here, and uh, we'll start with Pete. You know, we'd love to know how your company has participated in, benefited from the OCP networking ecosystem uh, of hardware, open hardware, and software. Uh, you know, I think for Cumulus, it's been very unique. I mean, we started with Oni, right? That was a Cumulus creation that was provided to OCP, you know, in the very beginning. Um, and our whole business model, the whole kind of way we run our company and how we interact with com customers and how we think about the networking ecosystem is exactly in line with OCP. You know, it's that open first standards, um, you know, collaborative approach. For us, we rely on Linux for everything we do, which although it's not OCP, it's kind of that same philosophy and mentality. Um, so again, whether it's us writing and open sourcing only, providing that to OCP, whether that's the work we've done um, on things like Facebook Voyager for optical uh, or anything in between, uh, it's really been core to everything at Cumulus since day one. Fantastic. Thanks. And Ricardo? Uh, well, um, Datacom has a, a, a dual perspective uh, as we provide uh, both hardware and software. From uh, As a hardware manufacturer, uh, we see uh, the, the community as a source of designs that are not uh, in our immediate roadmap. So with these additional platforms, uh, we have the possibility of um, augmenting our, our portfolio uh, fulfilling uh, different customer needs, um, penetrate segments that we are not used to. Uh, so this is a pretty interesting possibility of, of enhancing the capacity uh, in terms of product generation. Another side effect of that is that we can use some of this design as development platforms. So we can we are able to exercise our NOS uh, way before we even decide to design a, a, a new hardware platform. So the consequence of that is that uh, our software uh, is not necessarily the critical path for a new product since we have this uh, ability to play with different platforms. From another perspective, from, from as a NOS provider, uh, it's a pretty fantastic opportunity. It's, it's different because we are originally a, a kind of black box company. Uh, so we can, in, in this new environment, we are able to collaborate, to expand our business, to see ourselves as a software company, which is a quite different uh, experience. And, but on the other hand, the ecosystem, uh, it's a quite demanding group. So uh, there's a, a broad of different products, different markets, different segments, uh, different uh, initiatives uh, that goes even from the virtual OLTs on the broadband uh, market to access transport, data center. So it's, it's a quite, uh, overwhelming uh, opportunities as, as well, uh, and it's quite challenging, uh, but very exciting uh, by itself. Thanks, Ricardo. It's, it's interesting to hear, you know, just both you and Pete talk about, like, you know, uh, you just covered how you, Datom started as more of a black box company, but has been going through this transformation. Um, but then Pete also talked about starting just from the get go as being part of the open system, and it's, it, I think, it's interesting how both your companies with, with different histories are still able to come together within the, within the OCP ecosystem. So uh, thank you. Uh, Philippe? Yeah, uh, since uh, Kellum was founded, uh, the assumption was always uh, that we would productize our applications uh, being as open uh, whenever possible, hardware or software. Uh, in our case, there is uh, an additional very specific attribute, which is uh, that uh, we use programmability and in particular uh, P4 from an end-to-end. -end. Now, we really strongly benefited from the fact that uh, OCP uh, standardized the ONI interface um, as that our uh, ODM of choices, call it Acton, Edge 4, Invantec, etc., uh, continue to leverage the same interface um, as new switches with different form factors and, and specification come to market. So it's very important not only for us, but um, in majority for our customers to know that this will remain uh, a key tenant of our product portfolio, uh, leaving us as uh, Kadum to bring differentiation where it truly really matters in the application. And in our case, um, as I mentioned before, what is known as the 5G user plan function. Uh, again, it's all about accelerating time to uh, uh, market 
um, and, and focusing us on what really matters, the application, the higher layers, uh, leaving again the uh, OCP only uh, as the standard interface uh, for the hardware and for as many ODMs to come and contribute uh, to, uh, to hardware development uh, for uh, the best and the, the uh, highly competitive environment. Thanks, Philippe. That's interesting too, you know, just listening to both you and Ricardo, how you're both uh, finding ways to accelerate into uh, particular market segments based upon some of the openness of platforms that have come in through OCP. So um, allowing you to differentiate. So that's really, um, that's, that's actually makes me feel really excited about, you know, OCP networking, how far it's come in terms of really allowing companies to, to, uh, to share, but then also uh, move faster, hopefully, um, into their different market segments. So, Joe, um, do you want to take this question out too? Yeah, sure. So, you know, kind of following the lead of the, the previous presenters here, um, you know, we've been involved in OCP for, for several years now, primarily around the switch abstraction interface. And uh, like Ricardo said, prior to that OCP, we were more of a, a black box software provider, albeit. Um, and with the, the SI interface, you know, we've been able to be much more of an open provider of, of you know, open interfaces. So now all the software enhancements that we do are pre-ported to the SI interface, which enables our customers all the benefits of open networking, given that it's all built on an open interface. So it's, it's really been revolutionary for us. Great. Great. Another interesting take in terms of, obviously, like you said, many uh, years, of decades of experience and as you've seen the transformation into open hardware uh, and open software, that your company can take advantage of that. I also love how, you know, with um, all the different companies here, including, you know, the four of you all, but then also Microsoft and Facebook, we've all wind up helping each other in different ways, right? So you're referring to uh, Sai with Microsoft. Uh, Philippe, uh, Pete talked about some of the hardware platforms that Facebook developed uh, that you can kind of um, learn from or base your uh, offerings on. So uh, again, it, it highlights, I think, more than, than I think uh, I could have expected the, the, eco, the effect of the ecosystem. So uh, thank you all for that. So now looking forward, the next question, um, there's got to be challenges for your companies, right? It's not all just, a, hey, it's all clean and all easy. And so we've got you know, all, all these uh, uh, open platforms and open uh, software. So we'd love to hear from you what your challenges are, um, the biggest challenge that your, one of your company faces, and, um, and how can OCP and the OCP ecosystem help? Uh, so we'll go in reverse order. Maybe Joe will uh, go with you right again. Sure. Thanks, Omar. Uh, yeah. And I don't, I don't see this as much as a challenge, as more as an opportunity for, for Metaswitch. But you know, if you look at Metaswitch, our software is primarily used for system vendors who are building to more carrier and service provider type networks as opposed to data center networks. And what we'd like to see, or we think, you know, we feel one of the biggest opportunities in open networking is that into service provider networks. If you look at OCP, it's, it's largely dominated by data center players and, and vendors. And what we'd like to see is you know, how do we get more involved, the OCP more involved in service provider type networks? Um, and I think, you know, the work that OCP has done with the collaboration with company, with other committees like TIP and, and ONF have, have, are, are a great step. And it's a question in our mind is like, okay, how can we help build on those collaborations? Because those, those committees are much more service provider focused. I think that will help even take on more traction within, for at least for Metaswitch, but, but also OCP. So that that's, a big opportunity we see, and we're we're interested in working with OCP to, like I said, you know, further build on that. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And I think, uh, yeah, I think we've talked about that at a couple of summits now um, mm -hmm. over the last couple of years. Where uh, there's OCP networking, but there's also OCP telco. Um, but you're right; we can we don't do it all together. We don't. <laughs> we we realize that OCP itself is part of an even larger ecosystem, um, and yeah, I would love to hear from. Uh, going forward from yourself, but also from other folks, how can we engage that important telco service provider market? So thank you. Great. Um, Philippe? 
Yeah, Omar, I think um, that, um, as you heard before, I mean, at Calum, we, we made a bet not only on openness, um, as we leverage uh, OCP and ONI in particular, uh, but P4, uh, because we strongly believe that uh, this is really the next major evolution, uh, not only for the networking industry, but across the entire data center. Uh, so, um, and, and by the way, I'm not here to promote a single vendor. I think we start to see uh, more and more vendors um, that are starting to embrace this uh, technology. Uh, and we expect to see that more and more will, will come and, and embrace this, the benefits of this, such technology. So what uh, we would love to see uh, from the OCP is uh, to see uh, the OCP uh, going higher in the layers uh, in terms of um, essentially product providing this openness. Uh, because for us, it's again all about accelerating uh, applications uh, at the at the higher layer, with the expectation again that uh, uh, again the hardware and some of the data drivers are, are basically again standardized um, with the, the community comp uh, providing the, the key components. So again, for us, it's really about uh, uh, again uh, protect the investment um, and again leaving the customers focused on what matters not just the, the operating system, but the application uh, being executed in the app, where let it be an ASIC, an FPGA, uh, or a processor for that matter. So again, developing once, port across multiple platforms, independently of the target with multiple choices of performance, throughput, and cost. Again, once you have developed the application in one platform, it should be able to run on any hardware uh, from an end-to-end -end perspective. So that's where we, again, would really like to see the OCP uh, starting to collaborate uh, further into this area. Great. Thanks for that perspective. You know, I think, uh, and Shin and I have talked about this a number of times also in terms of how do you, um, you know, a lot of the software work within OCP started at the lowest layers, you know, with, with Cumulus and, and Oni. So you just get the image on the machine, and then over the years we've been evolving and saying, okay, how do we do more and more higher up? So um, I do agree. It's not a challenge just for your company. It's a good one to tackle for your company, but I think it's a good one to tackle for uh, for the whole group. So uh, thank you. And uh, Ricardo? Um, well, uh, my answer is uh, along the same lines. Um, we believe that uh, the software is right now the face in front of the customer. So the expectation uh, in, in, the history, in the industry is that you have to achieve in that platform the same level of quality and reliability uh, of a black box. So it means that uh, it will take a lot of energy to really put your logo there and, and ensure that it, it will work. We have some experience, for example, to take a white box, put our NAS there, and find uh, issues uh, on the platform that the, the vendor was not uh, aware of, just because we exercise it more than uh, usually uh, in that platform. So uh, when we see a hardware platform, uh, it, we, we tend to think that it's just uh, components, uh, it's just an electrical piece, uh, but in, on the top of that, there's a lot of, of basic hardware running there, drivers, device management infrastructure, and what we see, and it creates some difficulties for us, is the lack of standards in this low uh, low end infrastructure. Um, even in the same vendor, we see different ways of implementing drivers, implementing interfaces, and it makes each of the implementations, each of, of the platform that we support as a one-off effort. So um, my request uh, would be to have a minimum set of standards in these drivers, in this uh, inner infrastructure of those boxes. So it makes uh, our uh, introduction of, of new functionality easier because we can make just once and not one for each new platform. So that's mostly uh, our our difficulty in terms of, of the R&D effort that we have to uh, engage for each new uh, platform. We would love to support uh, all the platforms in the market, but it takes uh, quite a lot of energy. I see. That's, that's a great, uh, it's great uh, problem space to highlight. Again, I think that's one that uh, we've discussed before. I, I think actually you bring up a couple of things. If um, One is that quality and reliability. 
where I've heard actually in the past from 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 you all and other NOS vendors where yeah you're you're exercising and going through a, a rigorous te of test suites and use cases and then you're finding how um, maybe the hardware didn't anticipate that or the the layers underneath weren't prepared for that so I think that's a good good one to focus on and then the making platform onboarding easier and faster um, is is a good challenge so um, I'll be curious you know when we transition to the the live Q and A what which of these resonate with uh, with some of the audience so. Um, all right, Pete, you want to take us home here? Yeah, I won't harp too much on it since it's it's come up already a couple of times. But, you know, we at Cumulus spend a lot of time on the platform porting stuff. You know, for being a, a software company, I spend way too much time thinking about that low level of the hardware. Um, you know, and there's been some attempts in the past, something like APD, to try and address that. But it really just hasn't gotten the traction for one reason or another. Um, but that would be one thing that'd be great to see. But I think even outside of that, low level hardware component um you know i think another place is in the software you know sai and sonic are getting a lot of traction and making a lot of progress um, but even that's you know reinventing some of the wheels that already exist in linux um, you know whether it's net new or co-developing um, for some of those features and components and so i think that's one place where how do you take something like sai and sonic uh, or those software layers and make them more widely applicable. Um, you know, put the commonality where there's commonality and uh, unify some of those components. Good, good. You know, I think that's um, that's a unique perspective too in terms of um, how close how close is uh, is the development that we're doing that you're all are doing within the Linux and kernel communities. And how does that relate to some of the efforts that are going on within uh, within OCP? Um, another another good topic. So, um, so with that, I think uh, thank you all for for going through those couple rounds of questions. Um, we're going to now switch over to the um, the open Q and A session. So what uh, what will happen at this point is that uh, Shin and I will be going through the different questions that. Uh, um, you all, the audience, submit to uh, us through the, um, the chat software, and we'll then take those questions and then uh, present those to the panelists. Uh, again, thank you all very much uh, for listening. Thank you to the panelists for uh, presenting your perspectives and participating in the panel. And uh, we're now opening up to Q&A. Thank you. Hello? All right. Hi, everyone. Hello. So thanks, everyone, for tuning in to the panel. We've actually got uh, um, Pete, Ricardo, Philippe, and Joe on the line as well with, with me and Shin. And so uh, a lot of great topics brought up during the session um, that, uh, that we heard from the panelists. So we're open. If there are any questions, please get them uh, into the, uh, the little chat window or submit them via the Q&A uh, tab. Just wanted to recap, you know, a few of those uh, potential follow-ups that came. Um, you know, Joe went over, you know, can we do more, you know, uh, beyond data center and focusing with OCP Telco. Uh, Philippe brought, brought up going up higher in the layers. Uh, Ricardo, quality, reliability, as well as the minimum set of drivers, how do we support the platform? So, um, and then making, you know, unifying higher software layers with Pete. So, let's see if we got a question here. Um, how can, how can Kaloom or any, or other P4 programmable switches ensure that a software application uh, that's inserted P4 doesn't uh, disturb other software applications. So that question, um, you know, is uh, to you, Philippe, if you want to take that one. Yeah, the, the, the reason why we uh, chose essentially to use P4 is, is really because of the, 
uh, the, the protocol stack uh, that is required to essentially tackle this uh, market in particular. So if again, if you look at the reference architecture for the 5G and the UPF in particular, there is uh, a lot of GTP. Uh, and as we look at the future, we see as well some interest for SRV6, uh, for which we are doing some, uh, some interoperability in, in the next couple of months. Uh, and if you look again at the status of the market uh, for the uh, over ASICs, uh, there was not really a, a lot of choices available for us. So again, for us, it's not just again, uh, it's something very important. It's really the, the foundation of our differentiation uh, and the reason fundamentally why we went uh, into the combination of barefoot and P4. Uh, it, it's really the practically today the only choice available in the market uh, to deliver, again, a high-performance, uh, multi-terabit, uh, 5G UPF, uh, with, again, the, the flexibility uh, to offer uh, as the evolution. Again, we are not just looking at uh, 5G uh, this year, but we, we look at the free GPP uh, standard evolution, and, and we look, again, at uh, leveraging, again, a standard like SRV6 uh, to essentially service chain not only UPF alone, but with other services like security uh, in particular uh, to really uh, offer, again, uh, a, a full degree of differentiation for our customers. So again, to answer the question in a nutshell, it's really for us the, the, the telco, the edge in particular with 5G and the functionality as UPF uh, with, again, the protocol stat that definitely requires this degree of programmability and evolutivity, flexibility for the future. Great. Actually, I'm going to take that question and maybe, uh, thanks, uh, uh, Philippe. Um, I was sort of uh, um, thinking of taking that question and maybe looking a little bit, seeing how that applies to the other uh, panelists, right? You know, so there's one question to the panelists. Uh, do your NASAs support sort of um, operators to add their own applications on top of your NOS? And if so, how do you make sure that the, the interaction between that, that operator added software doesn't, you know, how do you mediate the interactions between uh, that software that uh, uh, an operator adds versus the software that you've written? Um, anyone want to take that if you, if you support that? Pete or Ricardo or Joe? Yeah, this is Pete from Cumulus. Uh, for us, the big thing is we are just a Linux operating system. Um, so we basically treat the switch like a server. So anything that you can apt install on the Debian, you have to install on the Cumulus. And then we just leave it up to that operator to more or less do the right thing and, and trust them. So you use traditional Linux uh, process control things like UDEV rules to be able to manage that. Um, but, you know, if you install a Bitcoin miner and it goes haywire, uh, that's, that's on you. <laughs> Um, but we have customers that are doing things like running containers or VMs and have just set process priorities and things like that to make sure that it runs successfully on the system. Great. Thanks. So in, in our case, we, uh, we are able to run, uh, sorry, we are able to run uh, VMs inside uh, as a container, so uh, any application have access to the same not bound interface as it was outside the box. So it gives some freedom to exercise uh, specific controllers or specific workflows uh, inside the box. Okay, we, we've got a few other questions here. Um, Let's see, so one, one question here coming in. What do you think are the most promising accelerators in switching hardware? That's a, um, it's potentially a broad question in terms of uh, uh, all the accelerators that we could be tapping into, but I'll just put it out there. Um, anyone on the, the panel wanna take that? Promising accelerators that you see in switching hardware? So I'm going to take this one, Omar, to, to start a conversation. So 
uh, again, as we look at, uh, again, the evolution of the, some of the ASICs, uh, in particular uh, Tofino, uh, we, we can see, again, uh, some, some value in, in accelerating some of the, the protocol stack from the 5G. Uh, the thing I would add as well is that our solution, uh, because the value of P4 is ultimately, via the compiler, uh, may be reusable for over platform and over target. In fact, as part of our solution, we plan as well to add uh, in complement to the Tofino uh, FPGAs as well. So again, depending on the uh, feature, uh, you can imagine again the low touch, high performance being executed into the Tofino. And then for more complex functions, including crypto or security like DPI, uh, we may use again the FPGA in complement uh, to the to the ASIC, uh, and then for even something even more high touch, uh, we may use uh, a Xeon uh, in, in, in complement. So again, for us, that's essentially the value is uh, we compile using the same compiler with the different targets, and again the solution uh, places uh, the processing using the right target based on the feature, uh, based on what's available at a given time. And that's, uh, for us, again, uh, a very important element as well of our strategy uh, to really offer this true end-to-end -end, uh, with, again, the, the, the low touch sitting at the very low end, multi-terabit, to FPGAs to increase the scalability or increase the security, and then the Xeon to, include, to execute something which is obviously lower speed, but which really complements with a high touch type processing. Got it. Got it. Does it make sense, kind of, having you we can uh, have the different, um, trying to have a consistent interface, but also have the different, the, you know, the ASIC and the FPGA or the, the general compute all kind of being leveraged. Um, thanks, uh, uh, thanks, Philippe. Anyone else on the panel want to talk about um, accelerators? Oops, wait a minute, let me see. Uh, Omar, if you don't uh, mind, this is Joe. Omar, this is uh, yeah. Joe Whitehouse, if you don't mind. If, I want to jump in on the, the previous question, if you will. I had an audio issue. Oh, sure, of course. Answer that. Yeah, no, I saw as that you as... dropped off, and so I was like, oh. yeah. okay, good. I apologize. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so the, the question was around sort of, you know, portable applications on top of NOSes, and just wanted to, to put our two cents in there that at Metaswitch, we see that quite a bit um, with our NOS deployments. So, uh, you know, how we address that is making sure we've got very clean APIs and the ability for people to plug and play the different types of applications and technologies that they want to do. So, for example, we've got customers that have their own route table managers, but they're using our routing stack. So as long as you've got very clean code that's um, got clean APIs that are well advertised with you and the customer, it's, it's never been an issue for us. Great. You know, I, I think it is a... It's a good question that that, uh, that came from the the audience there. I think, uh, or, you know, from the attendees in terms of, you know, how do we handle that and what sort of uh, safeguards are there? And um, um, but I think you know, different different approaches are different, right? You know, in terms of if you're more used to, if you're on Linux and you're doing whatever on Linux, you're used to sort of like making sure, hey, you don't, uh, you know, Linux provides all the low level tools to do. Uh, to do all sorts of things. So you have to uh, manage that a little bit more, or you can put a little bit more state safeguards in terms of whether it's strict APIs or all. So um, we have, uh, we had another question come in. Uh, if no one else wants to go over the accelerator uh, question, what market verticals are you seeing the most interest in open switch uh, operating systems? Um, maybe we can start, uh, Pete, do you want to, do you want to start us off there? I'll, I'll send that to you. Then we'll, we'll go to, to some other folks. Certainly. So we see Certainly. in the data center, of course, um, and that's kind of broadly, uh, across vertical industries, basically anybody who's still building data centers and has some reason to have their own infrastructure, whether that's a, a strategic reason, whether that's a um, 
you know, just a cost perspective because, you know, maybe they're using a lot of compute, a lot of storage and a lot of bandwidth. Um, the places where we're actually starting to see some emergence is in the access and one gig space um, where you're starting to see customers who are doing things like running retail stores um, or places where you need a lot of wireless access. And so the network infrastructure uh, is very, the physical network infrastructure is very uniform, um, very easy to automate, very easy to manage at scale. Um, but a lot of times they're not looking at, um, you know, an extremely hostile uh, physical access environment where they need a bunch of features for those, uh, you know, for security reasons there. And they're relying on, say, access points for that. So warehousing, logistics, and retail are some areas that we're actually starting to see a lot of interest in the open networking space. Great, great. Um, anyone else uh, want to take on, you know, what verticals are you seeing? Ricardo? Any thoughts on this? Oops. I think I'm back. Uh, okay. We're seeing some um, growing uh, in this interest from service providers and telcos. Um, once you start having from some of the people here in the in the panel um, features that are related to transport networks uh, and, and more complex uh, IP uh, environments. So we we believe that uh, there will be this trend happening. Uh, leaving the data center uh, as the initial uh, target uh, to other transport and, and more complex applications outside the data center or even interconnecting data centers. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so data center or interconnecting data centers as well as the, the telco environment. It sounds like that... Um, um, in the telco environment that probably lines up uh, with some of what you were saying, uh, um, Joe, as well. Yeah, I mean, the question was open switch, correct? As in the uh, OPX operating system? Is that what the question's around? Um, I didn't see it specifically talk about that. I thought I, I would interpret it as just what market verticals are, are seeing the most interest in open switching, like an open switch over operating system? Oh, I see. Okay. I didn't, I didn't uh, uh, okay. I, I unless somebody that. was okay, yeah. specifically so, asking about a project. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think as far as pure open switch type of environments agreed, I, I actually think we're seeing it more in the, the enterprise and, and obviously data center space. And... Uh, you know, like I said in the beginning, I mean, we'd like to see more traction in telcos, and, and telcos have made a lot of a lot of announcements along those ways. But a lot of times, it's you know, it's it's still more on the proprietary side, even though they're they're advertising it as open. And you know, we we'd certainly like to see more of that, you know, more complete openness deployed um, in the service provider and in telco space. So so you know, short answer, I you know, it's, it's certainly more dominant in the data center and, and enterprise space. Okay. Okay. Good. Well, okay. This market vertical question has has uh, has prompted a whole other set of questions here, which is uh, which is great to see. Um, one question: um, How about what about uh, the campuses in terms of uh, um, engagement? There, are we seeing more campus? I think uh, Pete, you touched on this a little bit in terms of the. Uh, access and one gig, but I'm, but I'm not sure if that's if we want to distinguish that with campus switching. Anyone want to anyone comment on campus engagements around open switching? Uh, oh, oh, this is Pete, and I'll expand on that a little bit. We are definitely seeing um, more in the campus. Again, it comes down to what are the needs at that access level. Um, so if you think about like a university campus where those physical access ports in a dorm or in a university are um, you know, almost always extremely hostile. You know, people are plugging in rogue DHCP servers and access, po uh, access points and, you know, just trying to get away with whatever they can on those, on those interfaces. 
generally that feature set of needs is higher than what's generally available out there in the open networking space today. Um, if you look at a more controlled, say, enterprise campus, where you're connecting phones, you have trust, um, maybe it's a VDI environment, those are great. Um, there's growing 802.1x support out there and some of the open networking software, including Cumulus, that's allowing for even those lower trust environments uh, to be used where you can rely on 802.1x to authenticate that user um, as they connect. Um, so there's definitely growing interest there as well. Um, I don't want to say it's nascent. It's, it's a little bit beyond that, but we're not quite at widespread deployment yet. But I, I see growing interest. Okay, great. Anyone else on the campus want to take the campus question? Uh, yeah. Uh, in, in fact, we see the campus application more like a metro uh, Ethernet application. And then uh, some of the features that we offer starting to make sense. More advanced in routing, uh, segmentation. Uh, so some of these things started making sense in this environment. It's still um, at the beginning, but uh, as far as we start offering some of these uh, advanced features, uh, I believe there will be some expansion uh, going on there. Okay, good. Thanks. Before moving on, anyone else want to chime in on campus? Uh, let's move on then. Um, so here's, a, here's an interesting question in terms of, uh, um, you know, we talk a lot about the disaggregated hardware and software. So in these verticals, such as, say, uh, within the campus or the access or the metro or in, in general telco environments, who handles the integration of the disaggregated hardware and software and who maintains the combined system? Right, so if, the, if people are buying white box, bright box switches from other companies and they're bringing your NOSes in, who integrates them and maintains them? Yeah, um, um, let me uh, jump here, uh, Omar. So on our side, for example, as we uh, interact mostly oh, can with I, telcos. Can I just also remind everyone, can you just make sure people, for people joining in, uh, just say, delete, you know, who, who are you? Who you are. Oh, yeah. yeah. For the reminder, hi, this is uh, Philip from Calum. Uh, so to answer the question, what I would say, uh, knowing that we at Calum are mostly interacting with, um, with, with service providers and, and, and telcos and, and some CSPs, is that typically those um, work already with some SIs, uh, system integrators, and, and we are working with SIs. Some are already doing this job of integrating hardware and software. Or, or in some cases when they don't, uh, we are going to um, help them to basically do this integration uh, because they see, uh, number one, that uh, in some cases they have no choice, meaning that the, their preferred uh, customer is asking them to do that. Or we basically um, add uh, essentially partners uh, into the mix uh, to basically address one uh, aspect. So, for example, recently we are working with a big CSP, and, and the CSP does some integration but works with some partners for one specific aspect, uh, fulfillment, or um, in some other areas for the management and orchestration. So they have a partner that will do uh, essentially this specific uh, uh, integration of uh, our code uh, on the top of the disaggregated hardware to make sure, again, that the whole orchestration and the life cycle of the entire solution can be done successfully. Makes sense. Um, yeah, so I think ISPs are, and or CSPs are, are often uh, used to working with partners, integrators to, to do that sort of integration and maintenance. Other folks? Uh, Omar, this is Ricardo here. Um, well, we, yeah. we believe that uh, there is a, a consensus that um, the face in front of the customer will be always the software. So, um, so even uh, no matter uh, who is the integrator, uh, the problems will happen on configuration, on uh, compatibility issues. So, so 
most of them are um, around the software uh, capabilities, software interfaces. So um, that's that's how we we think uh, it's going to happen, and it's happening right now. Mm -hmm. Omar, this is Joe Whitehouse from MetaSwitch. I mean, I, this might be an <laughs> overgeneralization, but from our view, what, what what we've seen is as you move from the core networks, the service provider networks, all the way to the campus enterprise side, you know, it, it seems that the bigger the network, i.e., the service providers, are more than capable of buying their own hardware from the white box vendors and buying their own software from the software vendors and putting it together. But as you get out towards the edge of the network to the smaller campus and enterprise environments, they're typically looking more for SI, fully packaged, even though they're disaggregated solutions, but they're fully packaged either by the software vendor, as Ricardo said, or, or potentially the hardware vendor. Mm -hmm. Okay. That is true. It, it is, uh, um, you know, there's a question that says in the verticals you mentioned, but it is different potentially for, for different verticals, um, their, their, uh, their willingness to do their own versus rely on uh, uh, outside uh, folks to do the, the systems integration. Cool. I think we, anyone else wanted to chime in on the, who does the integration and maintenance of the combined re-aggregated systems? Uh, this is Pete from Cumulus. I, the yeah. way I see it is there's, there's two different marketplaces, and I think there's um, absolutely space for commercial offerings there. I mean, this is exactly what Cumulus does, where we are ensuring the hardware software interface. We are porting our software to those white box and bright box systems, um, you know, and, and ensuring that we're spinning fans and flashing lights and all those components. Uh, I think the other side is just kind of the traditional do-it-yourself model um, you know, if you're taking something that's fully open in the ecosystem like Sonic and trying to do that, I guess the question comes is how do we, how do we make that accessible to a broader industry? You know, if I do really want to do it myself, what are my options there? And I, I mentioned in the, in the uh, beginning panel discussion in the video, um, you know, there's been some attempts at that hardware platform layer with something like uh, APD, which I can't remember. I think it was application platform descriptor or something like that was an attempt to do that, but it's still a space where the, the hardware vendors themselves have to be more willing to open up, have to be more willing to work in an open space and have to be more willing to provide the information required so that folks can uh, do it themselves and, and really start to accelerate that hardware software interface. Right, good, good. So I think just looking at, I'm trying to look at, thanks Pete, looking at the other questions here, um, there's also being sensitive of time. I think we'll, we'll take this as our last question. I know we were, we have scheduled to go until, um, let me just make sure. Um, we'll see how it goes, but the, look at this one. So uh, one question has come in about, um, you know, in terms of the adoption of the of the disaggregated solutions, what do you feel are the key challenges to to really see large scale adoption of your solutions uh, in in your in the respective verticals? Uh, and maybe we can take this uh, across everyone, right? You know, to say, uh, I know for some of you are focused on one vertical, your companies are. Uh, some are, are maybe attacking multiple verticals. Um, what do you feel are the, whichever verticals you want to, to cover, um, what do you feel are the key challenges for really wide-scale adoption of your solutions? I'll just open it up, uh, open it up whoever wants to chime in. Sure, I'll, I'll jump in. This is, uh, again, Joe Whitehouse from MetaSwitch. Our vertical, right, if I haven't made it clear already, is more targeted towards the service provider and telco networks. And I think we're starting to see this, but what we really need is, is more contribution and participation from a large number of vendors in some of the test events and some of the contributions such that these service providers really have that warm, fuzzy feeling that 
when they go to disaggregated and open networking that they can truly swap and replace as they see fit. Um, they can do best of breed um, networking, if you will. And we've got a lot of players that are, I should say, a small number of players that are, are very active in it. But you know, the more consensus we have, the more participation we have, I think that's going to be the tipping point for broader adoption in in these telco and service provider markets. So just to just to go into that, Joe, like, is it is it participation from other operators? Is it participation from specific vendors that you feel is missing, or like, what do we need more of? I'd like to more see more vendors. We're, yeah, we're out. Getting, yeah, good question. I, I was thinking more more vendors. Um, I, I think would be, you know. Like I said, would give would give those operators a better sense of feeling that they're you know it's truly closer to mass adoption now. And are those? Um, let me just look. In terms of the, um, are those vendors already participating with the OCP? Are they are they just not jumped in yet, or we need to bring them into OCP? Like, how do you? Um, yeah, well, we, just, I mean, they just, we need to have more events, like you said, test events and and interoperability events. Like what? Yeah, because I, I, I sense a hesitation of of service provider kind of deployments. Right? There's it's tough to measure what the actual market is when we don't see a lot of deployments yet. And so that's one of the theories we have that's kind of slowing up is is we need more more participation from more vendors such that the service providers really going to feel that everyone's in this now and everyone's going to be going, for example, to the SI interface or, or Sonic or, or whatever the interface is such that those service providers and telco markets can truly benefit from the, the HUD swappable capabilities um, of right. open and disaggregated network. Okay. And I think to your, to your point from the, from uh, earlier about, you know, those that vertical, you know, participating with the larger community, ONF and TIP, uh, to just name a couple that you had earlier, are are important for us to really uh, um, to. You know, they're not all going to be. They're already participating in in a number of other organizations, and so OCP, I think, and we have been doing this is um, uh, announcing partnerships and and trying to find these joint events. So, cool. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. Um, other folks. Who's Ricardo here? Um, um, what's your challenge for for adoption? Um, Omar. Yes. Philippe? Just to compliment the previous one, right. I think the right. telecom infra project uh, has an interesting approach to this uh, suggestion that Joe brought, uh, having the tip labs. So the tip labs are places where the vendors get together and they uh, work uh, as a kind of showcase for, for application. Maybe this, this would be a path to follow. Oh, that's a good, that's a good idea. And maybe then, I don't know uh, if we do that on our own or just in conjunction with OCP Telco and TIP, you know, that's, uh, um, that'll be interesting to see. Okay, thanks. Um, Last couple, uh, any uh, any comments on this uh, um, on this you know how to how to drive more adoption or the challenges toward adoption? Uh, this is Pete from Cumulus. I'll chime in here again. I think there's a couple of pieces. I think one is uh, around the the marketing of that adoption. So a lot of the folks who we work with who are deploying at scale who are widely successful also tend to be folks who don't want to go and talk or don't have the staff or the budget to put people in conferences on stage necessarily. Um, and, you know, we're seeing that it's not just like, oh, this tier one cloud provider, but we're seeing this also just an enterprise. There's not a culture and a lot of enterprises of doing conferences, of doing public speaking, of trying to do that thought leadership. So I think that's a challenge there. Um, but I also think that if we look at the industry, I think the industry itself is a challenge. We are extremely conservative bunch. Um, we are extremely reluctant to change. We are extremely unwilling to invest significant time and energy into changing how we do things. I mean, inertia is our biggest challenge. 
And if you look at even outside of open networking, you know, Cisco is obviously the dominant player and their number two is Arista. And I, I honestly believe a big part of that is just because of the, you know, identical command line. And that's been a challenge for Juniper because, you know, we see network engineers just unwilling to start to do those new things. Even as we start to see more network automation in enterprise, you know, there still continues to be uh, friction or reluctance to start to adopt these things, to learn, to, to explore, to do more and grow. And I think as long as that inertia is there, as long as there aren't, you know, existential threats to the organization that really kind of get people in gear, we'll continue to see challenges in this space um, just as a result of the, of the culture of network engineering. Thanks, Pete. And um, I think on that point, we would certainly encourage anyone, you know, as, as, as you all work with companies and if for folks on the line here, whether, you know, um, uh, enterprise service provider, cloud provider, if you're, if you're adopting uh, and using this uh, technology, our, our open technologies, would love to hear and have you share that. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, the, the, the Sonic um, keynotes and panel yesterday, I think, was a really, really interesting way to see, you know, and um, you know, that's just one example, you know, in addition to all of the, the NOSs that you all provide, where it does take a lot of time uh, to to get people to talk about it, you know, in terms of encouraging them to talk their far in their implementation or even just kicking the tires. Um, it does take some time, but I think that's something that we are at OCP are committed to to providing that platform and really encouraging people to share those adoption stories because it's that sort of, you feel good when everyone else is jumping in. And so just you have to tell everybody else is jumping in. And, um, and there is a lot of that uh, that we're seeing. So good. Thanks, Peter. Philippe? Yeah, I mean, uh, I will definitely agree with uh, what Pete said um, regarding the the fact that for the last 20, 30 years, you have essentially a, a dominant player, and it's very difficult uh, for uh, the networking bunch, as he said, uh, to basically look at, even consider an alternative. So um, the big seven uh, happened to change because they had no other choice, uh, financially speaking, uh, to deploy the, their application at scale. Uh, and now it's for again for the next wave uh, to look at this, uh, with fresh eyes and, and, and to look at an opportunity uh, versus as, uh, again, staying and looking at the legacy. So, again, um, I'm going to use my marketing hat uh, in that case and, and, and come to look at what we do at Calum, not just, again, from a pure um, hardware and P4, uh, but as well as the fact that we look at the operating systems slightly differently. Uh, we had uh, adopted the concept of, um, again, containers, uh, from the get-go uh, with essentially uh, an implementation of uh, Kubernetes uh, in such a way, again, that we focus on the application, uh, the CNF, if you want, versus looking at the operating system as the differentiator. Uh, the, dif the differentiator for us, again, is the application and how we can quickly uh, develop this application that matters to our customers as techos and service providers as again the CNF and how we can combine the, the CNF together, leveraging the best hardware for a given CNF at a given time. And then to Pete's point again, um, we are not going to look at a, a CLI anymore because we believe that if you want to deploy at scale again the CNF, uh, the CLI is just not po uh, a, a, a potential or realistic solution. Uh, debugging maybe, uh, but not for production and not for life cycle uh, when you have, again, uh, thousands of us to deploy into tens of thousands of sites potentially as we look at the market for 5G and, and the edge in particular. Right, right. You know, and I, th I think, you know, and maybe to, thanks, uh, Philippe, I think to, and then to, to wrap up the session, I think you bring up, uh, all of you all have brought really good points uh, along the way here in terms of um, there is a lot of, there's a lot of innovation that's going on. Um, you know, if you look at 
you know, networking has come a long way in, in many ways, but it's also still using a lot of the concepts over the last 20, 30 years, right? So uh, in the same conversation, we're talking about protocols or, or interfaces that were developed 30 years ago, when they were talking about newer technologies, whether uh, programmability or containerization or other things, um, that I think you know many of us here are at the at the leading edge and and forefront of. So there is progress in in, in a lot of ways, but I think this panel we've also we've also handled some of the the constants, right? Testing and reliability. Who does integration? Uh, what's the interface uh, that people are that our in network engineers are dealing with? Um, so as much as we want to innovate, uh, uh, we have to also innovate in some of those areas like testing and integration and interfaces to to bring along the whole com the whole ecosystem and community. So, um, I think with that, I really appreciate uh, uh, the panel, all of you all sharing your your thoughts here over this whole session. Um, there were a lot of other questions that. Uh, came in on the uh, on the chat. We couldn't get to all of them. So, uh, for the audience, really appreciate you engaging here. Um, if you want to ask questions uh, of the panel, um, you know, feel free to, to share those questions on, on the OCP well, uh, mailing list as well. Uh, we've also got a number of opportunities within the virtual summit. You know, with uh, um, connecting using the uh, the networking facilities of of the of the virtual environment that we've got here, whether it's uh, the networking lobby or or just reaching out uh, to the to the panelists. So, um, thank you all again. Thanks to the panel, and uh, enjoy the rest of the the summit. Thank you. <laughs>